Chapter 8. The Past On the screen are seen a series of pictures of school life. The morning continues. Before lessons, Osakin is called to the assistant headmaster, Gustav Luktik, a fat Czech who gives him a long lecture. Osakin tries to explain to him what has happened, but he refuses to listen and threatens Osakin with all sorts of terrible punishments. In the end, for all the offences committed in the morning, Osakin has his leave stopped for free Sundays. Lessons begin. Osakin does not even know what preparation has been set. Lois marks for Greek. The other lessons pass by safely. He is not questioned. Osakin sits through each lesson and moves during the breaks as though he were in a daze. It is painful to think of himself as a grown man, but then all his thoughts are occupied with Zenaida. But equally painful to think of himself as a schoolboy, for then he thinks of his mother and that she must soon die. After lessons, the boarders change into Holland blouses and go downstairs. They are not going out because the weather is bad. It happens sometimes in autumn that the boarders do not go out for three weeks at a time. What pleasure is there for the master in splashing about in the mud or walking in the rain? And as there are five masters and a different one is on duty every day, each of them thinks that one of the others will be taking the boys out. And after all, what does it matter if the boys stay indoors for a day or two? It never occurs to anyone that week after week passes in this way. And the assistant headmaster and the headmaster do not want to know anything about it. They do not come to the school until the evening. The boys scatter all over the big school building. The younger ones run down to the gymnasium. Osakin sits on a window sill on the first floor and gazes into the street. Everything is just the same. There is the sign, sausages and cheese, and next to it, meat and fish. Mud, rain, a disgusting late Moscow autumn. Horse trams, the jaded horses streaming with rain, and carriages with their hoods up pass by. Osakin feels miserable and sad. He would like to find himself at home sitting with his mother, reading or listening to her reading aloud. Or it would be nice to go somewhere, to wander about the streets in the rain. Sometimes this too is very pleasant. Perhaps he might even see Zinaida. Again, those same thoughts. But then, after all, is this a dream or is it a reality, he asks himself. What can prove that it is a dream? English, yes, because I could not have known it before. I began to learn it in Petersburg. How does that tale begin? The King of Duntrine had a daughter when he was old, and she was the fairest, King's daughter between two seas. He recalls the words of Stevenson's fable further in broken snatches. I can't remember it all, says Osakin to himself. I must get hold of Stevenson. But it's very curious. If I'm a schoolboy, how do I know this? And I know that I was in London and lived in a boarding house near the British Museum. And in Paris I knew every corner and turning in Montmartre and on the Rive Gauche. No, I will try to pretend that I am not asleep. That the magician has actually sent me back as I wish so that I can arrange my life in a new way. What then must I do? Everything has got to be different. I must finish school and to do that I must work and avoid such adventures as happened this morning. Of course it will be difficult for me at first, but in a day or two I shall get used to it. I am in the full form now. That means I shall finish school when I am 18 and go to the university. By the time I meet Zinaida, I shall have taken my degree. That will make all the difference. But what a very long time it will take, and how boring it is here, simply deadly. Yes, I understand perfectly why I could not work, and why I never finished school. How am I to endure this boredom? I must think of how I shall go to the Crimea with Zinaida. How wonderful that will be. In the evening we will sit side by side in the train and watch the fields go by. Then the steps will begin, then the chalk hills, then the steps again. Perhaps I shall get to know her sooner. Of course, I really ought to see her now. She is here in Moscow. She won't know it, but I shall see her from time to time. But how could she agree to marry Minsky? It was my fault. She really must have thought that I didn't come because I was interested in someone else. But now all that will be different. His friend Stockleff 
comes up to him. Sokolov is a little younger than Osakin and one form lower, but for some reason he's the only one to whom Osakin can talk. What are you dreaming about, Osakin? Do you know, Sokolov, says Osakin, you're going to be a lawyer. What nonsense, I'm going to the Engineering Institute. Nothing of the sort, you're going to study law, and now guess what I'm going to be. If you're going to spend your time like today, beating Wilhelm in the face with a pillow, and getting at least one bad mark a day, you're most likely going to be a tramp or a rogue of some sort. Well, maybe for old acquaintance's sake, I'll find you a signalman's job. Well, we'll see, says Osakin. There's nothing to see in it. It's as clear as daylight that you'll never finish school. Why do you speak so confidently? Because you do nothing. It's awfully dull here, says Osakin. But still, I have made up my mind to work. For nothing on earth will I stay another year in the same form. Sokolov laughs. How many times have I heard that? For two months now, you've been getting ready to begin to work. Well, tell me, what is set for Greek tomorrow? Ukraine, says Osakin, laughing. And you know you're going to have a red beard? Well, tell me some more lies. Why should I have a red beard? My hair is black. Yes, you will have a red beard and you will be a lawyer. I dreamed it. Let's go down, says Sokolov. They go off together. A few days later, evening preparation in school. Rows of desks. Through the open door, the junior boys' room can be seen. Lamps are burning. The boys are preparing lessons. Osakin, determined to begin to work, has drawn up a program for himself and is repeating Latin grammar. After reading a page, he shuts the book and, looking straight in front of him, repeats in his mind, Cupio, desiderio, opto, volo, apato. Damn, what does apato mean? He looks in the grammar. Oh, yes, well, and then volo, nolo, apato, expecto, posso, postululo, empetro, adisipso, experio, prastolo, prastolio. Again, I've forgotten. He looks at the book, then yawns and looks around. It's devilish boring. Yes, now I understand why I could never work before. Fancy inventing such absurdity as to make us learn bold grammar. And yet this same Latin could be very interesting. I remember those lectures at the Sorbonne. I went there to study psychology and became quite infatuated with Latin poetry. And now this school Latin is ten times more boring for me than it was before. Well, I must say that I've got myself into a mess, and I must make the most of it. But how sickening that I have to sit here for three weeks. How interesting it would be to see Moscow. Strange that I didn't realise how dull and boring it would be here. It seems that I can do nothing about it after all, and it was just as dull and just as boring then. In the junior classroom, when the master sits, a noise begins. Everyone gets up. First preparation is over. Two of Osakin's friends, Telioff and a Pole called Brahovsky, come up to him. Have you done your lessons? asked Brahovsky, laughing. Yes. You're lying. I've been watching you for the last half hour. I can't even make out what you were doing. I could understand it if you were reading something, but you just stare at the book. You're not learning a thing that's obvious. You just sit and stare at one spot. Listen, Brahovsky, says Os Osakin. Do you know the story about the Pole and the Cockerhall? The Pole said to the Cockerhall, You're a lazy man. For three hours I've sat watching you and you've done nothing at all. And the Cockerhall said, And what were you doing during that time? They all laugh, except Osakin, who looks at Brahovsky in perplexity as a fresh whirl of thoughts surges through his mind. He does not hear the rest of what Brahovsky is saying. I remember quite clearly, he says to himself, We stood here before exactly like this, and Brahovsky said the same thing, that he couldn't understand how I could sit and stare at a book, and I told him the same story. This shows how easy it is to slip into the old groove. No, all this must be changed. At these words he comes to a stop. It seems to me, he says, that even then I always repeated to myself that everything must be changed. A few days later, evening preparation again. Osakin feels very bored and very divided in himself. I must get out of this, he says to himself. 
After all, there are many moments in a day when one can simply walk out of the school. Why did I not do so at once? All this idea of returning is absurd. I just cannot stay here any more. I don't understand this situation and I don't believe in it. But even if I was stupid enough to return here, the sooner I get away, the better. If there is a possibility of change, this change can only begin by my getting away from school at any price. I must simply run away from here. But somehow, even while saying all this, Osakin knows that he will never do it. It would be too simple if we could do such things, he says to himself again. There is something in us that keeps us where we find ourselves. I think this is the most awful thing of all. But he doesn't want to think. For some time he sits without thoughts. Then, imperceptibly, he slips into the fantastic dreams which, in the past, were responsible for many unprepared lessons and for many bad marks. The dreams are called Travels in Oceanis. They are his best method of running away from reality. Osakin is sailing in the Pacific. The ship in a storm strikes a rock and is wrecked. Osakin, half dead, is thrown by a wave on the shore of an unknown country. He is found, brought to a house, revived and fed by the inhabitants. When Osakin recovers fully, he becomes keenly interested in these people. Very soon he realises that they are not like any others in the world. They are a very cultured and civilised race. They have founded an ideal state where there is no poverty, no crime, no stupidity and no cruelty. Everyone is happy there. They all enjoy life, the sunshine, nature, art. Travels in Oceanus is made up from half a dozen books he has read. But for Osakin there is something very personal and exciting about Oceanus. Many interesting things happen to him there. One or two of the inhabitants of Oceanus, sometimes it is a girl with a cheerful happy face, act as his guides, showing him various institutions of the country and explaining its social organisation. They go down to the crater of an extinct volcano. They climb snowy mountain peaks. They have dozens of strange and unexpected adventures. Sometimes, when his guide is the girl with the cheerful face, Osakin finds himself in very complicated situations. Either they have to spend the night in the same room in the solitary rest house, or rain and thunder in the mountains drive them to take shelter in a cave, or the boat in which they are crossing a river capsizes and they climb onto a small island and have to dry their clothes before a fire. On several of these occasions, Osakin's companion undresses and dresses in front of him without the slightest embarrassment, and this naturalness and freedom from restraint pleases him particularly and excites his imagination. While some adventure of this kind is taking place in Oceanus, Osakin is incapable of being interested in anything else on Earth. Why am I thinking about all this nonsense again, he asks himself irresolutely. Because there is nothing else to think about, he replies. After all, everything is equally absurd. But after some time, with a curious feeling of interest, he notices a definite difference in his dreams. He seems to be divided. One part of him continues to drift, inventing even more extravagant adventures and new subjects for talk with the inhabitants of Oceanus, while another part observes the formation of dreams and draws its own conclusions. The dreams themselves also change perceptibly. First, the adventures of the young ladies of Oceanus become less innocent and acquire a much more experienced character. And second, Osakin finds that his attitude towards Oceanus itself and its people has changed completely. In the old days, or as he says to himself, then, his attitude was full of curiosity and admiration. Now it is ironical, unbelieving and argumentative. He realises that not only has he lost the capacity to believe in utopias or enjoy them, but he has definitely acquired some kind of distrust of them, some suspicion that there is intentional lying, or at least a voluntary suppression of the truth. His talks with the party people in Switzerland, in Paris and in Moscow, and the unpleasant feeling which they always left in him are now definitely reflected in all that happens in Oceanus. He smiles involuntary when he realises that now he tries to prove to the inhabitants of Oceanus that they cannot be such as they pretend themselves to be. 
You are fools, he says to them. You cannot exist in reality. Even in imagination you can be thought of only in impossible conditions. We only show what is possible for all people and in any country, replies an inhabitant of Oceanus with whom he happens to be talking at the moment. You show exactly what is impossible for all people or any country, says Osakin. To exist you need bad logic and artificial conditions such as cannot be created in real life. And any attempt to bring into being a social organisation like yours will only result in the destruction of everything that is more or less decent and in general misery. Suddenly Osakin stops and his expression changes. But here is proof that I've come back from a quite different life, he says to himself. I never thought like that before. I was rather enticed by utopias. Now I know it's all just a fake and a very cheap fake. This is very interesting. I've been looking for proof. This is definite proof. I never could have thought like that before. Preparation ends. Osakin walks in a noisy crowd of boys, full of his new thoughts and his sudden discovery, and he feels rather sad. Oceanus will no longer be as attractive as it was before. Probably it will disappear, like his other dreams in which he imagined himself a famous general or famous poet or a great painter. Some days later, night, the school dormitory. Osakin is lying on a hard bed under a red blanket. The faint light of a lamp half turned down comes from the far side of the dormitory. I understand nothing, Osakin says to himself. Now everything seems to be a dream, both the present and the past. I should like to wake up from both. I wish I could be somewhere in the south where there is sea, sunshine and freedom. I should like to think of nothing, expect nothing, remember nothing. But how strange. The magician said I should remember everything until I wished to forget. And already I want to forget. It seems to me that during these last days I have forgotten a great deal. I can't bear it. It's too painful for me to for me to think of Zenaida. Maybe this is a dream. No, it cannot be a dream. I really was there. So everything that is happening now was the past then, and what happened then is now the past. What surprises me most is that I take it so calmly, without even being particularly astonished, as though everything were just as it ought to be. But what can I do? Perhaps we accept all extraordinary things in this way, however astonished we may be. Nothing changes, and we begin to pretend that it does not seem astonishing to us at all. When my grandmother died, I thought, what an inexplicable and extraordinary thing death is. But everyone takes it for granted. What else can they do? I remember thinking during the funeral that if all the people on earth suddenly disappeared and only one man remained, then for one day it would seem terrible and astonishing to him, but the next day he would probably think that it was quite normal and inevitable. How strange to find myself at school again. I remember these sounds of breathing, each one different, just like clocks ticking in a watchmaker's shop. I remember that I often lay awake at night then too and listened. What does it all mean? I wish I could understand. Chapter 9 A Dream Osakin dreams that after lessons, while he and Sokolov are walking in the gymnasium, talking about something or other, he is unexpectedly called to the reception room. His mother sometimes comes in to see him about this time, so he goes up the stairs and through the long corridors without expecting anything unusual. In the reception room he sees a beautifully dressed young lady who is quite unknown to him. He stops in confusion, acutely aware of his ink-stained Holland blouse, the tufts of hair sticking out from the back of his head and his whole schoolboy appearance. He has evidently been sent for in mistake for someone else. But the young lady looks at him, laughs and holds out a small hand in a yellow suede glove. Heavens, how big you have grown, she says, and you don't seem to recognise me. Osakin looks at her and knows not what to say. She's very attractive with large sparkling eyes. He feels still more awkward. He would like to say something pleasant, but he is ready to wager that this is the first time in his life that he has seen her. For some reason it seems to him that she is making fun of him by saying that he has grown so big, as though she has known him before. 
but for what purpose he does not understand. Well, you don't know me, she says in a clear, girlish and singularly pleasant voice. Think and you will remember. She looks at him and laughs. For a single instant, quicker than the quickest thought, a recollection flashes through Ossikin's mind. Yes, he does know her. Why had he not realised it at once? But when could he have known her? Ossikin quickly searches through the memory of his whole life up to the moment when he went to the magician and he can say with certainty that she was not in that life. Oh, how funny you are, she says. So you've probably forgotten me. Don't you remember me at Svenigorod? I was older than you were. You remember? I had a red ribbon in my plait. Don't you remember how we drove to the mill and how another time we went to look for Jochaka? Osikin remembers Svenigorod, where he lived with his father and mother when he was quite a little child. He remembers the water mill in the forest and the smell of the flower, the smell of tar from the boats by the ferry, the white monastery on the hill and the wood with the ice-cold springs above the road. And Juchaka, the little black dog who once disappeared and couldn't be found for a long time. But there was no girl with a red ribbon there. Of this he is quite firmly convinced. He feels again that she's making fun of him. But why? Who is she? How does she know about Sveni Gorod and Juchaka? He is silent and she continues to laugh her infectious laugh. She takes him by the hand and makes him sit down beside her. He becomes aware of the scent she uses, a faint but strangely penetrating perfume. This scent at once tells him an extraordinary number of things. Yes, of course he knows her, but where and when has he seen her? Maybe she was part of some other dream. He recognises this sensation. When dreaming, he remembers another dream. Why are you so silent, she asks. Say something. Are you glad to see me? I am glad, says Osakin, flushing painfully and feeling quite unable to stop being a schoolboy. Why are you glad? Because I love you, says Osakin, not knowing where the courage comes from to say it, and at the same time burning with the agonising shame of being a schoolboy, while she is a grown-up young lady. She laughs outright now, and her arse laugh and the dimple in her cheeks laughs as well. Since when have you loved me? she asks. I've always loved you, answers Osikin, even that time at Svenigorod, and somehow this lie seems necessary. She gives him a quick look, and immediately something is understood and accepted between them. It is as though they had agreed about it together. Very well, she says, but what shall we do now? I came here because I couldn't find you anywhere else. Osikin realises that she's been looking for him there, but where there is he cannot say. He understands that, for some reason, this need not be said more plainly. Well then, she says, are you going to stay here? No, answers Osakin to his own surprise. Certainly not. We'll run away. I mean, I shall run away with you. We'll go downstairs together, and while you are getting on your things in the hall, I'll put on someone's coat and go out to the front steps. Then we'll take a carriage and drive away. Well, let's go, she says, just as though everything had been decided between them long ago. There is something Osakin both understands and does not understand. A whirl of new expectations fills his whole being. It is so extraordinarily pleasant to feel, all at once, so many new things and so many unexpected changes. Ahead there again lies something new, something that has never happened before, something sparkling and filled with brilliant colours. They come out to the landing and go down the stairs. The staircase is long and dark and quite unlike the one that leads to the hall. We've come to the wrong staircase, says Osakin. It doesn't matter, she whispers softly. This one will lead us straight out. In the darkness she puts her arms round his neck and laughing softly presses his head to her. Osakin is aware of the touch of her arms. He feels the silk and fur against his face. He is aware of her scent and the soft, warm, tender contact of the woman. His arms go round her hesitantly. He feels the soft, firm breast beneath her dress and corset. A painfully sweet tremor seizes his whole body. His lips are pressed to her cheek and he hears how quickly she is breathing. Her lips find his. Is this really true? asks the voice inside Osakin. Yes, of course, another voice replies. 
A wild joy fills him. It seems to him that in that moment they separate themselves from the earth and fly. Suddenly at the top of the stairs a harsh and disagreeable bell begins to ring and voices are heard. A painful feeling at once grips Osakin's heart. She is now going to disappear. We are too late, she says quickly, freeing herself from Osakin's arms. Osakin too feels that he has lost her, that something infinitely beautiful, radiant and joyful is escaping from him. Darling, listen, I must run or it will be too late, but I shall come again. Wait for me, do you hear? Don't forget. She says something else as she runs swiftly down the stairs, but Oskin cannot hear her, for the bell, ringing louder and louder, drowns her voice. Already she is out of sight. Oskin wants to rush after her. He makes an effort to see where she has gone and opens his eyes. The frog, with his turned-out feet, is passing quite close to his bed, ringing a bell with an air of concentration. It is morning. Several seconds pass before Osakin comes to himself. He is filled with the happy tremor of the kiss, with the sharp anguish of its passing, and with the joy that it has happened. What he has experienced is so utterly out of keeping with the dormitory, the shouts of the boys and the glaring light of the oil lamps. He is still acutely conscious of the scent, of the touch of arms around his neck, of soft hair brushing his cheek. All this is still with him. His heart is beating very fast. His whole body seems to have become alive and conscious of itself in a sort of happy wonder. Who is she is the first clear thought that comes at last to his mind. She said she would come back, but when? Why did I not hear what she said to me at the end? What am I to do now? He is desperately sorry to lose his dream. It seems to him that he might still overtake her and ask her who she is, where she comes from, and what is the meaning of all this mystery? If that was real, then everything happening around him seems so unnecessary, so senseless and stupidly irritating. It is dreadful that another day is beginning and that he must live through it. At the same time, it is so good that it has happened, even if only in a dream. It means that it can happen again. Now some golden rays are shining in the distance, as though the sun were rising. But who is she? Where does she come from? he asks himself again. I don't know her face, and yet I do know it. Or do I? All day Osakin goes about in a kind of mist, still under the influence of his dream. He wants to keep it all in his memory and to live this dream over and over again. He wants to understand who the unknown girl is. But the dream fades, grows pale, vanishes, yet something of it remains. In the middle of the day, returning to his dream and comparing the memory of it with the impressions of life, Osakin suddenly realises with amazement that the image of Sineda has grown faint and shadowy. He can now recall her without any pain. Even yesterday it was different, but then a single thought of Sineda caused him acute pain. As he realises this, there flashes through his mind for one tenth thousandth part of a second, not a recollection, but a shadow of a recollection of a young girl with a red ribbon in her dark plait whom he was telling about Sven and Gorod. So that is where she got it from, he says to himself. But in the same moment he feels that he has again forgotten everything. Only the realisation remains that this happened at a time when everything connected with Zineda already belonged to the past. Perhaps that too was a dream. Once more his mind catches a certain thread of thought. Yes, yes, he says to himself, almost afraid to breathe. Does it mean, could it have happened afterwards? But after what? And then, quite unexpectedly, his mind comes to a conclusion and he says to himself, this has not happened, but it will happen if I go on living. He does not fully understand this conclusion as yet, but his whole being is filled with gratitude to this girl for having come to him. Having made this last effort, his mind refuses to understand any more. Osakin feels that his dream is quickly fading and disappearing and that soon there will be almost nothing left of it. Until evening he keeps returning to the dream in his thoughts and several times he thinks that he has flashes of understanding of strange things. There is no essential difference between the past and the future, he thinks. We only call them by different words, was and will be. In reality, 
All this both was and will be. All day long the school and his surroundings seem utterly unreal, like transparent shadows. At times it seems to Ossikin that if he could lose himself deeply enough in thought and then look around him, everything would become quite different and perhaps the continuation of his dream would then begin. Chapter 10. The Schoolboy. Sunday. Winter. It is snowing. Ossikin, a schoolboy in a grey overcoat with a black fur collar and silver buttons, and a dark blue cap with the silver school badge of laurel leaves, is walking down a small street near Porovsky Gate. He stops at a corner and looks about him. Yes, of course, he says, here are all the old houses, just as they were before. But I've seen it quite changed. It is surprising how many changes can take place in twelve years. Well now, I must take a look around. The Krutiskis' new house doesn't exist yet, but they are living somewhere near here. Oh, if I could see Zenaida. But how strange, what could I do even if I did see her? I'm a schoolboy, she's a little girl. And the funny thing about it is that then, too, I used to wander about Moscow streets and alleys, and sometimes just here, feeling that I had to meet someone, find someone. But it is no use despairing beforehand. It would be good to see her, but I must certainly find her brother and get to know him and make friends with him. He should be in a cadet corps, but which I don't know. That has gone completely out of my head. I remember he told me a lot about his corps. Now I begin to forget everything. Yes, of course, I must find him, otherwise we shall not meet each other at all. I hope this time I shall go to the university and not to the military school. And besides, when we were in military school, Zineda had already gone abroad. This time we must certainly meet sooner. How strange it all is. Sometimes it seems as if my former life, the magician and Zineda, are all like travels in Oceanus. Well, we shall see. He stops in front of her house and reads the nameplate on the gate. This is the house. Now, what next? He looks into the courtyard. There is the front door. Probably they live here. A courtyard porter crosses the courtyard. Ossikin moves away and walks further along the street. I'll walk about here, he says to himself. Perhaps someone will come out. It would be splendid if Grotisky came out. I should speak to him at once. Confound it, I suddenly remember that he was either in Petersburg or some provincial corpse. Damn, if that's true, how can I find Zineda now? Ossikin walks back down the street. A sledge overtakes him and stops at the gate of the Krutiskis' house. A little girl and a lady wearing a fur cape get out of the sledge. While the lady is settling with the driver, Ossikin walks past and looks at the little girl. Is it Zineda or not? I don't think so. I should surely recognise her. But perhaps it is. In any case, this little girl is like her. He turns round once more. The lady in the fur coat notices him and looks at him in surprise. Ossikin flushes and walks on faster without looking back. Damn, how stupid. A schoolboy who stares at a little girl and it's not her at all. And why should the lady give me such a surprised and questioning look? How absurd it is. People always take things in a stupid way. How could she know why I turned round? How idiotic. Still, I wonder who they were. It's a pity I didn't see the lady properly. Perhaps she was Zineda's mother, but I don't think so. He stops at the corner of the street. Well now, what next? So far I'm behaving like an ordinary schoolboy, and I can't think of anything else to do. It's simply silly to walk up and down an empty side street, and besides it's getting cold. Also, it would be awkward if they noticed me. They would say afterwards, We've seen you before. You were always walking up and down our street. Why? No, I'll go another way. Anyhow, I know where they live. What a pity that I may not be able to find Krutiski. He turns the corner. Chapter 11. Mother. At home, Sunday evening, Osakin and his mother are sitting at the tea table. She is reading and he is looking at her, thinking that soon she may die. The scenes of her funeral on a sunny, frosty day rise vividly before him. He feels cold and distressed at the thought of this. 
and he's frightened and terribly sorry for her. Osakin's mother puts down her book and looks up at him. Have you done your lessons, Vanya? This question catches Osakin unawares. He had quite forgotten about lessons. All his thoughts were so far away from anything connected with school. His mother's question seems boring and petty and it irritates him. Oh, mother, he says, you are always talking about lessons. There's plenty of time yet. I was thinking of something quite different. She smiles. I know you are thinking of something different, but it will be unpleasant for you if you go to school tomorrow with your lessons unprepared. If you sit up at night, you will not wake in the morning. Osakin feels that she is right, but he is reluctant to give up his sad thoughts. There is something entrancing about them, while his mother's words remind him of material, ordinary, everyday things. Besides, he wants to forget that he is a schoolboy and that there are textbooks, lessons and school. He wishes that his mother could understand his thoughts, could understand how sorry he is for her, how much he loves her and how strange it seems to him now that he could ever have resigned himself to her death. He feels that he cannot tell her anything, that all this is too fantastic, and even to himself it appears like one of his usual daydreams. How can he tell her about the musician, about that former life from which he has returned? How indeed convey to her why the very sight of her evokes in him such piercing pity and pain? He would like to find some way, even if indirectly, by which it would be possible to tell her about it all. But his mother's words prevent him from speaking of this and make him think of things he wants to forget. Oh, mother, he says, you're always talking like that. Well, suppose I don't know my lessons. Suppose I don't go to school. Is it worth talking about? He is irritated and begins to lose the sensation of that other life from which he was looking at this one. It becomes still more difficult to tell his mother what is troubling him and irritation against her flares up in him and he wants to say something disagreeable, although at the same time his pity for her almost approaches physical pain. I won't go to school tomorrow, he says. Why not, says his mother, astonished and frightened. Oh, I don't know. I've a headache, he answers, using the schoolboy's stock phrase. I just want to stay at home and think. I can't be among these idiots for so long. If it were not for these stupid punishments, I should not be staying at home now. I can't go on like this. They'll shut me up again for two or three weeks. Do as you please, says his mother, but I warn you it will only make things worse for you at school. If you don't go tomorrow, they will take it as a challenge on your part, but you must decide for yourself. You know I never interfere in your affairs. Osakin knows that his mother is right, and this makes him feel still more angry. All this dull reality of life and the necessity of thinking about it distracts him from his sad thoughts, from the strange sensation of two lives, from the troubling memories of the past and the future. He does not want to think about the present. He wants to escape from it. I won't go tomorrow, he says out of sheer obstinacy, although in his heart he feels how unpleasant this is for his mother and he realises that he is going against all his own resolutions to arrange his life in a new way. Well, this will be the last time, he says to himself. I'll think things over tomorrow. I must have a day at home. The school won't run away. Afterwards, I'll set to work. He wants to go back to his thoughts again. Do you know, mother, he says, it seems to me that I've lived on the earth before. You were just as you are now, and I was just as I am. And there were many other things too. I often think I could recall everything and tell it to you. And you loved me then just as little as now, and did your best to make things unpleasant for me, says his mother. At first, Osakin does not understand her and looks at her in surprise, so utterly out of harmony are her words with what he is feeling. Then he grasps that she is offended with him for not doing his lessons and not wanting to go to school. It seems both useless and tedious to protest. He feels that at this moment his mother is holy in this life, and he does not know how to convey to her the sensation of that other life. He grows still more despondent at her failure to understand him. You are still talking about all that, mother, he says. Well, I will go to school. He says this reluctantly because in his heart he knows that he will not go. The thought of not going to school is always so strong that it is enough to admit it for a moment and it conquers everything else. 
Of course I want you to go, she says. You know how they look on your absence at school. The assistant headmaster has already told me that they hardly put up with you there as it is. Have they sent for you? he asked. Why, of course. Osakin is silent, not knowing what he can say to this. There is every reason why he should go to school next day, but he does not want to and already knows that he will not go. He tries for some time to find some pretext or justification, but it is unpleasant and boring to think about all that. His own quite different thoughts trouble him. Is there no possible way of conveying them to his mother? It is so necessary, so important that she should understand. Osakin sits looking at his mother, the most conflicting mood struggling within him. He feels her worry and alarm, and this makes all the memories of his life up to the moment when he went to the magician fade away and seem almost imaginary. His life abroad, Zineda, the grey house in Arbat where he was living less than a month ago, all this has now become like a dream. Above all, he does not want to believe that his mother dies and that he remembers her funeral. To think about that here in this room in her presence seems nightmarish, invented and unreal. He tries not to think of the past, tries to forget it. In his heart he knows that it has actually happened. But to think of it makes this life altogether unbearable. Three weeks of life at school have made a gap between him and the Osakin who went to the magician and now the same gap lies between him and his mother. His thoughts move in a circle, continually stopping at certain particularly painful points. I don't believe that mother can die so soon, he thinks as he looks at her. She is still quite young. Even if it happened then, why should it necessarily be repeated now? Everything ought to be different this time. If I have come back, it's precisely for this purpose. There are things, of course, which do not depend on me, but perhaps by altering my own life I should alter her life as well. After all, the troubles and vexations she had with me then must have had their effect. She died of heart disease. There will be nothing like that this time. He longs to tell his mother that he is going to be different, that he is going to work and change his whole life for her sake, so that she may live. He wants to believe that this is possible, that it really will be so. He tries to find some way of conveying this assurance to her, but cannot find the words. He does not know how to approach the subject. He is tormented by the gulf of misunderstanding which lies between him and his mother, a gulf which cannot possibly be bridged. From his mother, his thoughts again wander off to Zineda. Now he thinks of her without bitterness. The news that she is to marry Minskin has somehow lost its vividness or become merely a threat. Only the good remains, their meetings, going on the river, their talks, the evenings when they used to sit alone together, their dreams, even their arguments. All this will happen again and will be still better without the dark clouds which then obscured it. He will prepare for their new meeting. He will not be in such a helpless position. He will not lose her and his mother will be alive. She must certainly see Zineda. He feels that they will like each other. This thought is particularly disturbing to Osakin. He visualises quite clearly how he will bring Zineda here to see his mother. He is conscious of the slight feeling of tension and constraint of the first few minutes, which passes off later to be replaced by a wonderful feeling of harmony and assurance, as though they had known each other all their lives. As usual, Osakin begins to picture in himself how things will happen. What a dear your mother is, Sinada would say, looking at him and smiling as he took her home. I told you she was, he would answer, gently pressing her hand, which would give a slight, scarcely perceptible response. Will you have some more tea? asked his mother. The question makes Osakin start and stare at her in surprise. For a second he feels ashamed of his sentimental dreams because he realises that neither Sinada nor his mother would share in them. Next moment he becomes irritated. Neither Sinada nor his mother ever understood him or what he feels. They have both demanded insignificant and external things from him while he strove to give them all that was innermost and deepest in himself. Yes, please, he answers mechanically, trying to recover the broken thread of his thoughts. 
and so the evening passes. To his mother, Osakin appears to be unnaturally dreamy, silent and self-absorbed. He answers her in monosyllables, often does not hear her, as though all the time he is thinking of something else. She feels ill at ease with him and sad, and she is afraid for him. Chapter 12, Monday, morning. The maid calls Osakin at half past seven. He wakes up with the uncomfortable feeling of having something to decide. Shall I go to school or not? Yesterday he did not even open his books. It is impossible to go if his lessons unprepared. Much better to stay at home for a day or two. At the bottom of his heart he decided yesterday morning that he would not go today. But he must find some pretext. What a nuisance having told his mother that he would go. For a long time he lies in bed instead of getting up. He puts his watch by the pillow and follows the movement of the hand. The maid comes in several times. At last, at half past eight, when he ought to be at school, Osking gets up. He's annoyed with himself for staying at home and yet he feels that nothing could have induced him to go to school. Today he wants to think of something pleasant. Everything unpleasant, difficult and tedious should be put off until the day after tomorrow. Today he will lie on the sofa, read and think. But something seems to gnaw at his heart. He cannot get rid of his qualms of conscience and of an uneasy feeling about himself. This is all wrong, he tells himself. If I've really come back here to change everything, why am I doing things in the same old way? No, I must decide firmly in what way and from what moment everything has to be changed. After all, perhaps it is a good thing that I've stayed at home. At least I can think things over quietly. But why do I feel so wretched? Now that I've done it, I ought to be feeling cheerful. Otherwise it is just as unpleasant to stay here as to go to school. At that moment he realises that he is depressed at the thought of how he is going to face his mother. The worst of it is, she will say nothing. It would be much easier if they discussed it together and tried to see each other's point of view. Then perhaps in talking with her he might find a way of making her understand what he knows and what he is thinking about. Unfortunately it would not be like that. She will say nothing and that is the most unpleasant thing of all. Osakin feels dissatisfied with himself and disgusted with the whole world. Now I remember just such a morning when I didn't go to school, he says to himself. I remember it led to a great deal of trouble and in the end my position at school became absolutely unbearable. No, all this must be altered. I shall begin work today. I'll send to the school and ask someone to write out what preparation has been set. Then I must have a talk with mother. I cannot be a boarder. She must arrange for me to be a day boy. His imagination quickly draws a picture of himself sitting with his mother in the evening doing his lessons. A warm, pleasant feeling comes over him and in this mood he leaves the room. Osakin is having breakfast with his mother. She is hurt and remains silent. He is annoyed because she does not realise that he has seriously decided to begin working and because she still attaches importance to his not having gone to school today. He sulks and remains silent. His mother leaves the dining room without saying a word. Osakin feels injured. There was so much he wanted to tell her, but she raises a barrier somehow between them. He feels unhappy. When he thinks of school, he realises that his absence today will not be passed over without a reckoning. Now he has not the slightest desire to begin to do anything, either to read or to think, and least of all to learn his lessons. He stands by the window for some time and then walks resolutely towards the door. I'll go for a short walk, he says to himself, then I'll come back and set to work. To him it is extraordinarily exciting to see Moscow streets now. To begin with, on a weekday, an unusual time for him, everything looks different. And two, the most familiar places now remind him of the past, of what happened at another time. They are full of strange, disturbing memories. Osakin returns home for lunch. A teacher has been here from the school, the maid tells him. He spoke with the mistress. He's very angry. Osakin's heart sinks. 
How could I have forgotten that, he asked himself. The assistant headmaster must have sent one of the masters. Why, of course, and he didn't even find me at home. I remember this is just what happened. Now the trouble will start. I wonder what mother said to him. His mother comes in. She looks upset. Vanya, a master from your school has been here, she says, and I didn't even know you were out. I didn't know what to say to him. I tried to invent something, said you had suffered all night with toothache and had probably gone to the dentist, but it all sounded very clumsy. He said that as soon as you came home, you were to go at once to the school, taking the dentist's certificate with you, otherwise they will send to him themselves. All this is so disagreeable for me, I don't know how to lie. This master cross-examined me like a detective, asked me when you went to bed, when you got up, to which dentist had you gone. Why do you put me in such a position? What are you going to do now? Osakin feels sorry for her. He feels penitent and ashamed and above all terrified by the fact that everything is beginning to happen exactly as before, as though the wheel of some terrible machine was slowly turning, a wheel to which he is bound and which he can neither stop nor hold back. Yes, all this happened before. He recalls every small detail, his mother's words, the expression on her face, the frozen window panes, and he does not know what to reply. I wanted to talk to you, mother, he says at last, with a kind of chill at his heart, knowing that he's repeating his former words. I can't go on being a boarder and I shall not go to school today. You'll have to go and speak to the headmaster. They must let me be a day boy. I've been kept in for three Sundays and all this time we have not been out of doors. The masters are too lazy to take the boarders out for walks and they make the bad weather their excuse. Each one thinks only of himself and no one realises that they all do exactly the same. Tell that to the headmaster. It's a scandal. I can't bear it any more. You know, Vanya, that I've always wanted you to live at home myself, says his mother, but you understand that if you cease to be a boarder you will lose the right of free education at the government expense. You will not be able to claim it again later. Think what would happen to you if I died suddenly. I should like you to stay another year or two as a boarder. I don't want to think that you may die, says Osakin. You're not going to. Why think about it? Perhaps I shall die before you. I can't live at school any longer. I can't stand it. It is better to lose this government scholarship. They talk for a long time and then his mother goes out. Osakin is left alone. This is terrible, he says to himself. Is it possible that the magician is right? Is it true that I cannot change anything? Up to now, everything has gone like clockwork. It becomes terrifying, but it cannot be like that. I'm not a schoolboy. I'm a grown man. Why then can I not deal with the life and affairs of a schoolboy? It's too absurd. I must take myself in hand and make myself work and think about the future. So far, everything is for the best. I shall be a day boy. I know that will be arranged. Then things will be easier. I shall read, draw and write. I must try not to forget anything. How is my English? He thinks for a long time. There are many things I can't remember. I shall tell Mother that I want to learn English, buy some kind of English manual and pretend to learn it. I'm sure I shall still be able to read English. But the main thing is to do my schoolwork. Not for anything on earth will I stay a second year in the same form. If I don't stay, it will mean that I shall finish school. When I pass to the fifth form, it will be a sign that I've began to change things for the better. I remember I remained in the fourth form before. Chapter 13 Reality and the Fairy Tale A year later, the gymnasium at school before lunch. Osakin and Sokolov are standing by the window looking out towards the courtyard. Osakin is now a day boy, but he has remained in the fourth form and Sokolov has caught up with him. What's this new trouble between you and the turnip? asked Sokolov. I don't understand what it is all about. Oh, nothing particular. They are all idiots. You are not at the geography lesson. Well, I was answering about towns on the Volga. I began from the top and came to Nijini, and I said that this is the town where the Volga falls into the Oka. At first he didn't understand, then simply leapt up and shouted at me. You don't know what you are saying. You mean where the Oka falls into the Volga? No, I said. I mean just what I said where the Volga falls into the ochre. He shouted, Are you mad? No, I said, I'm not mad at all. Then what do you mean? 
I mean that there is a mistake in our geography books because it is not the ochre that falls into the Volga, but the Volga that falls into the ochre. You know, he just opened his mouth and couldn't say anything. How do you know, he said at last. Oh, I said, I've seen it myself. When you stand on the high bank of the ochre, you see that the Volga, with its two flat banks, falls into the ochre, which is much bigger than the Volga at this place, and certain it is the ochre that continues further with one high bank. He became quite crazy, sent for Gustav, then for Zeus, but Zeus didn't come. I think he was still at his lunch. They may expel you. Oh, quite easily. You cannot imagine how tired I am of all this. I'm tired of these boys and of all these idiots. Sokolov shrugs his shoulders. I don't understand you, he says. You wanted to be a day boy. Now you are a day boy. What more do you want? What the devil is it to you whether the ochre falls into the Volga or the Volga falls into the ochre? You are interested in everything that does not concern you. One day they find your desk full of newspapers. We are interested in politics. Another day they find such books that our pedagogues don't even know which end to begin from. You're damn funny. Do what you like at home, but why drag everything into school? And you do nothing that you ought to do. You learned English in one summer, but in Greek you've had unsatisfactory two years running. But don't you understand, says Osakin. It bores me. What do I want Greek for? Tell me, what for? If ever I need it, I'll learn it. But why now? Now, so that you can finish school and go to the university, says Sokolov. You keep on philosophising when you ought to take things simply. Oh, you're too sensible. I shall be glad when you slip up at last. I shan't slip up. We'll see about that, Osakin looks at Skolilov and laughs. He is often amused because he knows what is going to happen. An assistant master comes up to them. Osakon, go to the big hall. The headmaster wants you, he says. So they've got you. Goodbye. We shan't see each other again, laughs Skolilov. Osakin laughs too, but rather nervously. These explanations with the school authorities are always unpleasant and there is a heavy score of sins standing against him. Ten minutes later, Osikon runs into Skokolov in the doorway of the classroom. What? Still alive? Yes, old Turnip has lost. Zeus was in a rather good mood today. Evidently, he'd had a good lunch. When I told him that the Volga falls into the Oka, he laughed like a crocodile and said that he never knew that and always thought it was the Caspian Sea. On the whole, he was quite benevolent and rather amused. Well, I'm to be kept in school till after five, and of course it's for the last time and all the rest of it. The next time he won't even talk to me and so on. Did he say that? Why, yes, of course, the fat pig. So you're to be kept in. You know that they say that the inspector of the educational circuit is coming. They will show you off to him as an exemplary pupil, knows English, reads Schopenhauer, and is so diligent that he refuses to leave school until six o'clock. Then he'll probably come during lessons. No, afterwards, they say. Well, he can go to hell. Osakin goes to his seat. Second bell, the French teacher comes in. This is one of Osakin's favourite lessons. He is in a privileged position because he knows enough French not to have to bother about the lessons. He need pay no attention to what is going on and can think his own thoughts. The Frenchman does not worry him and only occasionally, in fact very rarely, calls him to his desk, chats with him in French for a few minutes and gives him full marks. The Frenchman is the only teacher who speaks to him as a grown-up, and Osakin always feels inwardly grateful to him. When they meet in the street, the Frenchman always stops to shake hands and talk. The only decent man here, thinks Osakin, looking at him. Osakin opens the famous Magot, the French manual in which many generations of Russian boys have forgotten what little they may have known of French before going to school, and becomes engrossed in his thoughts. I understand everything less and less, he says to himself. If I've come back here from another life, and if all I see here is real, then where is Zenaida, and where are all the others? Some are here, but does it mean that they go on living there at the same time? If this is so, it means that we not only live in one time and in one place, but that we live in different times and in different places simultaneously. That alone is enough to drive one mad. How can one find out the truth? Has it happened or not? No, it's better not to think about it. I'll read. How can I live without reading? It is the only way to escape from my thoughts. He opens an English book under the desk. 
It is Stevenson's Fables. Yes, here's the tale, he says to himself, the song of the morrow. How can the title be translated? Well, there is no escape from faults after all, so I'll at least try to make some sense out of this tale. Ossikin reads for a long time, trying to fathom the meaning of Stevenson's strange fable. At last he shuts the book and sits gazing into space, almost without thought. In this tower there is some hidden inner meaning of which he is vaguely conscious. With it are connected so many strange and incomprehensive memories. Chapter 14. Punished. The same day, after lessons, an empty classroom. Osakin is sitting with a book at a desk by the window. It is growing dark. Osakin closes the book, looks straight in front of him for some time, then glances at the lamp. Evidently, they're not going to give me a light, he thinks. Very well, I'll have to sit in the dark. But how stupid all this is. God, how stupid it is. And what does life itself actually mean if I cannot alter anything? It is only a wind-up clock. What then is the sense of anything? What sense is there in my life, in my sitting here in school? Of course, I cannot force myself to be a schoolboy. Of course, I'm bored without people, without life. I cling to books in order not to lose myself in these surroundings. I feel that with these boys, I often become a boy myself. I'm becoming ridiculous in my own eyes. I'm like a man who, finding himself obliged to live in a distant province, tries to maintain an inner connection with the capital so as not to become provincial. He subscribes to papers and magazines which are really quite useless and even ludicrous in his provincial life. And he likes to think about things which perhaps had meaning in Moscow or in Petersburg but have no meaning at all where he is. In any case, all this is rather funny. I have a special interest in reading the newspapers because I know what is going to happen. Only it's a pity I've forgotten so much. After all, the magician was right. Not only can I alter nothing, but I'm beginning to forget a great deal. It's strange how quickly some impressions disappear from memory. They're preserved in the memory solely through constant repetition. If repetition stops, they disappear. I have a regular kaleidoscope of faces and events in my memory, but I've forgotten almost all names. I've tried to find Zenaida, but I've failed. To keep on walking past their house is absurd. I found the girls' school where she should be now. I waited there two Saturdays, but how can I recognise anyone's? The girls come together in a crowd. They laugh, and certainly I must look funny standing there as though I were a lassie boy. Although I liked two of the girls, neither of them could have been Zenaida. They were both older than she would be. Krutiski is not in any cadet corps here, so it means he is not in Moscow, and I can meet him only in the military school. But by then Zenaida will already have gone abroad and will not return for six or seven years. Very well, it is inevitable. I must either find her abroad or wait here. But I must not be in the same helpless position when I do meet her. By that time I may already have taken my university degree. There will be no need to go to the military school and everything will be quite different. The dreadful thing is I do nothing to achieve this. How could it have happened that I was left for a second year in the same form? To lose a year, four and a half more years inside these walls. I don't know, but it seems to me I shall never be able to stand it. The chief thing is that now I've lost every aim and I'm simply bored of knowing all that I know. And the worst of it is that when I was at school before I was equally bored, because then too I knew everything. This is the most awful fault. It seems to me that everything repeats itself, not once or twice, but scores of times, like the blue Danube on a barrel organ, and I know it all by heart. And sometimes I think exactly the opposite, that nothing has happened before, that I've imagined it all, that there was no magician, no Zenaida, no other life. But where could I have got it all from, and many other things? I don't know. Only one thing is certain in all this. I often want to smash my head against the wall from sheer boredom. Chapter 15 Ossakin gets up from the desk and walks up and down the half-dark classroom. Then he goes to the big glass door that leads to the corridor and tries the handle. The door is not locked. 
They've forgotten to lock it, he says to himself. Is there nothing I can do? It's so awfully dull. I've still a whole hour to sit here. He hears a noise and then footsteps hurrying along the corridor. Probably they are expecting the great man, or perhaps he has arrived. Osakin says to himself, he opens the door a little and looks out. There's no one there. Well, let's go and raconteur. He steps quietly into the corridor. All is still. Glancing through the glass doors of the empty classrooms as he goes along, Osakin reaches the library or reception room where, in his dream, he saw the unknown girl. The room is brilliantly lit. He looks cautiously round the edge of the door. There is no one there. Damn, he says. His Excellency will be going through here. Shall I write something on the wall? Welcome your Excellency with one or two mistakes. That would be a good idea. What a pity there's no chalk. He thinks. But there's something still better I can do. He puts his hand into his pocket and takes out a pair of blue spectacles. Facing him on a bracket over the door leading to the big hall stands a plaster bust of Caesar. I'll put the spectacles on Caesar. That's bound to be noticed. Osakin runs on tiptoe to the other end of the library, brings the chair, climbs on it and puts the blue spectacles on Caesar's nose. The spectacles fit beautifully and Caesar acquires a scholarly air. Osakin carries the chair back to its place and runs into the corridor. Now he no longer wants to go back to the empty classroom. He wants to devise something else. He tries the doors of the classrooms along the corridor one after another. One proves to be unlocked. Osakin looks all around him, then slips inside and gropes about until he finds a piece of chalk behind a blackboard. He runs back to the library and on the wall, just underneath the golden tablets on which the names of head boys are inscribed, he writes in plain round letters, unlike his own, and misspelling all the words, Welcome, Your Excellency. Then he draws an ugly face with a gaping mouth and astonished eyes and shaking with laughter runs back to his own classroom. There he sits on the windowsill and looks into the street where the lamps were already lit. What the devil drives me to do all these stupid things, he asks himself. Now they will start an inquiry and of course they will think of me first. The worst of it is I remember quite clearly that I did this very same thing before and I was expelled for it. Now why did I do it? Of course it is tedious here but that's what school is for. Can these idiots understand a joke? For them, I'm an ordinary schoolboy. Of course, they would guess I did it. If only I could lock myself in somehow. He goes to the door and tries to handle. Then he looks at his watch. Another half hour to wait. If only I could get away. He walks up and down. After five minutes, he stops at the window again and looks into the street. Well, the spectacles wouldn't matter so much, he says, but they won't forgive me for the misspelled excellency and the face on the wall. The spectacles too. This is disrespectful and all the rest of it. Well, of course, I deny any knowledge of it and I'm not I and the horse is not mine and I am not the driver. But unfortunately, the assistant headmaster has a way of nosing me out. Often nothing points to me, but he simply says, call Osakin and that is all. It will be like that now. No need even to call me when it comes out that I was sitting in a classroom nearby. The whole thing will be perfectly clear. Damn, perhaps I'd better go and rub it out. No, it's not worthwhile. I might get into a worse mess. He looks at his watch. Fifteen minutes more. I wonder if I could lock myself in. He goes to the door again and examines the lock. There are footsteps in the corridor. Osakin jumps away from the door and again goes to the window. Time passes slowly. He looks at his watch every minute. At last, Cockroach, the class servant, comes to the door with a bunch of keys. He fumbles for a long time picking out a key, tries to unlock the door, shakes his head, takes another key. Finally, he gives the door a tug and it opens. What's this, he asks. Was it unlocked? No, locked, answers Otter King, coming up to the door. You unlocked it with the first key. Well, you can go, says the cockroach. Kranich told me to let you out. Well, cockroach, says Osakin, here's 20 kopecks for you. The cockroach is very pleased and gives Osakin a friendly pat on the back. Cockroach will be on my side, says Osakin to himself, but the show will soon begin, so now is the time to save my skin. 
He runs downstairs and through the gymnasium to the hall, which is lit with unusual brilliance, in readiness for the arrival of His Excellency.